morning from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. The question is asked, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all of these. He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let us pray. Father, as we are before you in worship this morning. We understand the questions asked in Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Do you not understand? Lord, we thank you by your grace. You've given us knowledge and understanding of who you are. You are the great God described in Isaiah 40. The creator of all things. And you never grow weary or tired. And Father, we are here this morning, some of us, very weary and very tired. And we ask for your strength. Even your grace, O oh Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may worship you in a manner which is worthy of who you are. We pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Please remain standing and you'll find the words to our first two hymns printed in your worship folder. We'll begin by singing, Rise, O God, and Shine.
exhortation, come boldly to the throne of grace. Literally a quote from the book of Hebrews, where the writer of Hebrews says we ought to come boldly before God's throne of grace. And one of the things we do when we boldly come before God's throne of grace is we bring with us our sin, the burdens of our sin, the shame, the guilt, and the things that accompany our sin. And we leave them there at the throne of grace. Confess, we repent, and we ask God simply to forgive and relieve us from such burdens. So join with me now as we seek the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we have just sung of your gracious throne, a place wherein you are seated and your great and glorious Son, our Savior, is there at your right hand. You exhort us in the scriptures to come with great confidence, yea, even boldness, to such a place. Even though we are sinners, even though as born-again believers we continue to fall into sin and give way to temptation, nevertheless, Father, You tell us to come. So we come now, Father. We come confessing our sin. We come repenting in the silence of our hearts. Father, we have come even as you have commanded to your throne of grace. And we thank you again for what we have received. You have not shunned us, you not, have not pushed us aside. You certainly have not condemned us. Rather, you have remembered what your Son Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The glorious power of his shed blood, which is for the forgiveness of all of our sins. So, Father, what we have received from you again is grace and forgiveness of our sins. And we are ever thankful and pray in Jesus' name. The words of assurance as we have confessed our sins of the Lord are drawn from Romans 7, where the Apostle Paul, in the first person, is confessing uh, the sanctification process that he and all believers are in and the real battle uh, that we have uh, in our struggle against sin. And so let us together be reminded of uh, what is true. This is the unharnessed truth of what it means to be a sanctified believer. Join with me. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. What we're reassured thereof, his ultimate deliverance. We receive forgiveness and grace in the here and the now, but one day, my friend, the Bible promises we will be delivered completely, utterly from the presence and the power of sin. Let us confess our faith this morning. The Heidelberg Catechism has brought us to question 103, where the fourth commandment, which has to do with keeping the Sabbath, keeping it holy and in proper dignity, so I'll ask uh, question 103, if you will please answer in unison. Question 103 asks, what does God require in the fourth commandment? First, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that the sexually unclean and the unclean and I diligently attend the church of God, to hear God's word, to use the sacraments, to follow well the the of the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the Lord. Second, that all the days of my life I rest my evil works, let the Lord work in me through His Holy Spirit, and so begin in this life to be eternal Sabbath. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. 
Amen. Heavenly Father, we are before you this morning in worship. Even as you have commanded to keep the Sabbath holy, that we are to set aside this first day of the week. It's a very special day that we gather to worship you according to what you teach us in the fourth commandment. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath rest that is ours each and every Sunday. A day that hopefully by your grace we can set aside the cares and the worries of this world. We can rest completely in Christ. We thank you as well, Father, for the great eternal Sabbath rest that you have promised us in Christ. When one day you will deliver us to glory and we will eternally rest from our striving and struggling that was ours in this earth. We will ever rest glorious presence of our Lord. But Father, we are not there yet. We are here in the land of the living. We understand what the Scriptures command us to be doing. That is your will, O Father. In obedience to everything that Christ is taught as well as the apostles, Father, we desire to do these things. And so, Father, we pray. You tell us to pray. You tell us to pray without ceasing. You tell us to pray about all things. So, Father, we turn to you in prayer. For the sake of your glorious kingdom, do we pray. We thank you for the works of the gospel ministry that go on incessantly, 24 hours a day, all over the face of this earth. This morning, we lift up Sam and Jen Huxford, a young family that minister with the Navigators at Florida International University in South Florida. Father, we know that that campus is now sprawling with thousands and thousands of students and Sam and Jen and their fellow navigator missionaries are right in the middle of it. We pray for their boldness. We pray, Lord, that you would give them a real anointing from the Holy Spirit as they reach out with the claims of Christ, as they go about their discipling ministries, teaching the new converts the ways of Christ. Lord, we pray you watch over them and their young family. Protect their children. Keep them strong and, and healthy. We pray you bless their marriage as well, for we know that the enemy against believers, against their families, against their marriages. We pray for their protection. Lord, we look to you on behalf of our own church here at Redeemer. And we pray as well for the families here in our church, for the mothers and fathers, for the husbands and wives, for the covenant children. Uh, Lord, we lift these up and we pray that you would continue to make yourself manifest in, in their lives in a powerful, powerful way continue to lead and guide husbands and fathers and their families and, and wives and mothers. Continue to work mightily in our covenant children, raising them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And we look forward to the day when all of these, by your grace, will come to profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for those who are not well. We continue to lift up John Edwards and pray for his strength. He is at a stage in life so elderly where he is very weary. And we just pray, Lord, that you would visit him in a special way. Help him. We uh, thank you for Bill Gandy's recovery and, and the manner in which he is regaining his strength. That he was able to come to a meeting of the building committee this past week. What a great testimony, Lord, of your powerful healing presence in his life. Father, we pray for those who are grieving. And we lift up Connie Register and her entire family with the passing of her nephew and just pray that in the throes of their sorrow and grief Lord they would know your consolation that you would draw nigh to them and draw close to them wrap your ever loving arms around them O oh Lord as they seek your face and seek your peace in the midst of this uh, tragic uh, circumstance and finally Father we uh, turn our hearts in prayer to the situation all the way on the other side of the world in Afghanistan there is such turmoil, such upheaval. And Lord, we specifically pray for your people there. We know there are many churches. We know there are many believers and missionaries and servants of the Lord in that country. We know that the potential is for great persecution to come their way. We have already heard reports of persecution against believers. We pray for their protection, for their well-being, for their welfare. If it would be your will, O oh Lord, that they might safely be able to get out of that country. We pray for peace in that land. There is so much 
hatred in that place. And we uh, pray, Lord, for our government and for our military and for everyone involved that this situation can somehow subside and the hostilities might uh, be lessened in some way. Thank you, Father, for hearing the words of our prayers. They have been brought to you in the name of our matchless Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning, our New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 10. Uh, preaching through the names of God, I am at this time, uh, this morning, going to be preaching on Jehovah Rophi. The Hebrew word Rophi means healing or the healer. So we're going to be talking about God and His healing ministry. And in Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 34, uh, we have the record of uh, what was going on in the early church, a testimony about Christ and the healing that was already taking place. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear Him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how He went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with Him. We are witnesses of everything He did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed Him by hanging Him on a tree, but God raised Him from the dead on the third day and caused Him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with Him after He rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about Him that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins through His name. Let us now give to the Lord tithes and offerings. Father, here on this Sabbath day, we come before You. We have tithes and offerings that we gladly and joyfully give over to the work of Your kingdom. We pray only that you would bless these gifts, multiply them into the lives of many people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God who will sing all the way my Savior leads me. to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes. If you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals. Since the reading of this portion of God's holy and inerrant word, what an amazing revelation on the part of God. Confirming to His people that I understand your problems, your issues, your frailties. But I am here as your God, the one who heals. You know, here in America, uh, many would say we have the best health care system found anywhere in the world. It's the largest, the most effective, some would say. One of the most expensive, others might chime in and say. But nevertheless, we have this great health care system that has helped us so much, especially even thinking about during this COVID pandemic. But we have something else as believers other than the great American healthcare system when we think of healing. You see, God, Jehovah Rophi, He provides the ultimate source of healing as we're going to see this morning. You see, God heals His people in many ways. 
which enables them to experience God's love in deep and meaningful ways. We're going to look at uh, several of the ways that the Bible describes that Jehovah Rophi, the God who heals, does just that for His people. And you'll recall two weeks ago we looked at Jehovah Jireh. The word Jireh meaning provider. Jehovah, the God who provides. And I would say that one of the major provisions of Jehovah Jireh is healing. What would God provide? Healing. He says there in Exodus 15, I am your healer. So we're going to look at uh, three different ways that the Bible teaches us about Jehovah Rophi, the God who heals. We're going to look at spiritual healing, emotional healing, and physical healing. Jehovah revealed Himself as the God who healeth thee. And this morning, we want to grasp the depth of God's healing in the lives of His people. There's much to be learned. The Bible speaks quite a bit about God's healing ministry among His people. But let's begin by just unpacking literally what we have before us in Exodus 15. Jehovah Rophi, the God who heals. What? What happened that day out in the desert there in modern day Egypt? Uh, what, what, what happened? Well, uh, we know that Israel had a need for God to do something in their midst. For God to bring a special kind of healing. They had been wandering for three days in the desert. Remember, there are upwards of five million in this throng of Israelites out there in the desert. They were desperately thirsty and they found an oasis or so they thought some type of spring. The waters of Marah. Somebody ran down there real quick and did what? <laughs> See what we got here. And got a handful of that water in their mouth and it was bitter. It was not potable. It was not anything that anybody wanted to take unto themselves. Israel needed God to provide for their thirst. And all they had before them was water that was no good. So they needed God to heal the bitter waters. And God does just that as it explains to us in verse 25. God heals the bitter waters. God is obviously aware of the need for the healing of these bitter waters. And Moses is given instructions. Moses take a piece of wood and throw it into the water. Not set up some type of filtration plant or something that we would do in our modern day. No, take a piece of wood. Perhaps he just picked up a random stick and threw it into the water. And it tells us that God heals the waters. That the waters become sweet now. They become drinkable. You do realize this is absolutely sustaining the people of Israel. Without this healing of the waters at Marah, there would have been mass death amongst the Israelites. We know you do not last long in a hot desert without water. And then God pledges something in the aftermath of the healing of the bitter waters of Marah. He says to Moses and the Israelites, this is what I would have you to do. Trust me. Believe me. Obey me. Submit to my lordship as your God. And I as your God, Jehovah Rophi, the God who heals, I will continue in this healing ministry as you have beheld what I just did turned bitter water into sweet water. Now why would God use the healing of bitter water by means of a piece of wood to reveal Himself as Jehovah Rophi, God who healed? Well, why such, in my opinion, kind of an extraordinary, very unusual circumstance that He would now say to His people, I am a God who heals. Well, some say it was just pure coincidence. Others say 
Wood was a favorite miracle object of God. You recall things like Moses' staff and Aaron's staff and things that were wooden that were miraculously used. But there are a number of theologians that I tend to certainly agree with when you ask the question, why a stick in the water? Why then the water from bitter to sweet? Well, some say that this was an illustration of the cross of Jesus Christ. In that our lives outside of Christ are filled with the bitterness of sin. The bitterness of sin and Jesus' death on what? on a wooden Roman cross is what brings healing to the bitterness of our sin. It's interesting to think about, is it not? But it is the circumstance where God definitively for all time declared of Himself, I am Jehovah Rophi, the God who is your healer. So we're going to look at three areas of healing. We're going to look at spiritual healing. We're going to look at emotional healing. And we are as well going to look at physical healing. Well, let's begin with spiritual healing. Jehovah Rophi provides spiritual healing for His people. Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3 says, listen closely. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. I would say our spiritual disease is the first disease that we needed healed. It's the spiritual issue between an unconverted person and a holy and righteous God that needs to be healed that needs to be reconciled. And so in Psalm 103, you have the benefit spoken of, the forgiveness of the sins of God's people spoken of, in terms of it being a type of disease that God says He heals. Well, how did God do this spiritual healing? He, he had to take action. Well, we primarily understand the spiritual healing ministry of Jehovah Rophi through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus made His mission very clear when He came to the earth. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 and following, we read this about Jesus. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Him and His disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus defines his mission. He's a practitioner of spiritual healing. And we read all about it in many, many, many different episodes recorded in the Gospels where Jesus does exactly what He said He came to do in the spiritual realm. One of the most profound is found in Mark chapter 2. I will not direct you to read that along with me, but I think the story will be brought quickly to your remembrance. It's the story of Jesus beginning His public ministry. The people are beginning to hear that He is one who changes things in people's lives. People who are sick are made well. People who are possessed by the devil are delivered and on and on. And such a huge crowd in Capernaum gathers around to hear Jesus and hopefully get close enough maybe to be healed and Jesus is inside of a small house. Now there are four men who show up with their friend. And he's crippled and he is laid out on some type of a portable pallet, mat, something like that. And these friends of this man are so desperate to get their friend to Jesus, the healer, that they do what? Well, they began to deconstruct 
the roof of the home. <laughs> they get him up there. Somehow they lower him down. They get him into the presence of Jesus Christ. And what's the first thing that Jesus says to the man who's obviously paralyzed, obviously crippled? Is the first thing that Jesus, the great healer, says to that man, get up off the mat and walk? No, it's not. The first thing Jesus says is, Son, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing He says to the guy. Jesus does what He came to do. He knew there was faith on the part of this man's friends. He knew there was faith on the part of this man himself. And Jesus knew it was saving faith that He declared that this man's sins were forgiven. Now this caused quite an upheaval that the Pharisees went ballistic. They accused him of blasphemy. Who are you to say to someone that your sins are forgiven? And so Jesus says, so that you will know that I have the authority to forgive sins. Let me add this to my ministry moment. Son, get up off the pallet and walk. The fellow gets up off the pallet and walk. Now, listen closely. The physical healing was a confirmation of the spiritual healing on that day in Capernaum. You see, Jesus' primary ministry is that of spiritual healing. Every miracle He did Every deliverance from demonic powers that he did was all Christ saying, Oh, you see the power I have to physically change the lives of people. But I tell you of my greater power, and that is to spiritually heal the sin. And so think with me about the components then of what it means to be spiritually healed. If you're here this morning, you're professing Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've repented of your sins. And you have been born of the Spirit of God. I can assure you, along with myself, that this is the experience of spiritual healing that we have had. The guilt of our sin needed to be atoned for. We were so guilty before God, and we couldn't atone for our sin. The curse of condemnation that was against us. It needed to be taken away. The curse needed to be erased, eradicated. They had no power to do such a thing. <clears throat> the barrier between us and God needed to be knocked down. There needed to be reconciliation where there was none. Salvation needed to be put into effect. Faith needed to be given to us that we would believe in Christ, that we would be saved. And God did all of these things so that we could be spiritually healed. Back to Psalm 103. To be forgiven, to be forgiven is to be spiritually healed. To be forgiven by God of your sins is God's way of saying you are are spiritually made whole. I have raised you up and made you whole. Well, I don't know of the situation with everyone in the congregation this morning, but you might be sitting on one of those comfortable pews this morning and be in very reasonable physical health, and you might be reasonably emotionally healthy this morning. But let me assure you of something, as I assure myself, that we were all incredibly ill, incredibly sick, even dead, as the Scriptures described, until Jehovah Rophi healed us spiritually. There was no way for us to heal ourselves. There was no prescription that we had unto ourselves it was God's doing. Jehovah Rophi, Psalm 103. Do not forget all His benefits, for He is the one who forgives all of our sins. Yea, 
He heals us. Well, let's move on and talk about Jehovah Rophi's ministry of providing emotional healing. And rest assured, the emotional healing flows out of the spiritual healing. One of the amazing things about the life of a born-again believer are the many benefits that come the way of a born-again believer in that because you are spiritually whole and spiritually healed in the eyes of God, there flows from that emotional healing. Things that deal with our fallenness, our brokenness, the heartache and the pain that even as believers we still experience. Listen to what Psalm 147 verse 3 says. Psalm 147 verse 3 says, God heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. God heals the brokenhearted. He takes those who are wounded, emotionally scarred, and He brings healing. What, 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 what would this healing look like? Well, I think all of us here this morning honestly understand kind of healing that God helps us with. Uh, surely we need healing from past emotional pain and wounds. Things that have happened in the past. A lot of times we are so wounded and so broken hearted in our life filled with such real pain because something's happened and there's not been closure, there's not been forgiveness. There's not been grace exercised either on our part or on the part of the other people or mutually. It just hasn't been, it just hasn't been exercised. And so we carry around emotional pain about things in the past. We see God gives grace to enable us to do something as believers that maybe you or I were never able to truly do before we were believers. We can forgive. We are told by the Apostle Paul, forgive as you have been forgiven. So God gives a believer the grace to forgive someone, maybe in the past that has hurt us so deeply. God gives us peace to enable us then to forget. Oh, we talked about Jehovah Shalom just last week. The God who is our peace. God gives us peace to say, you know what, it happened. Forgiveness has taken place. And I don't have to be haunted by that anymore. I can rest now from that. God gives us compassion in order to move on and in love again. Maybe love the same person that hurt us so deeply. These are all gifts of God. Things that God graciously gives to His people. I think about the story in the book of Genesis about Joseph, the son of Jacob, and his brothers. We know of this story well, don't we? Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. They think they'll never see him again. Joseph, to make a long story short, ends up being the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. There's a famine in Canaan. Jacob dispatches his sons, go down to Egypt. I hear that there's a very wise man down there that has stored up grain. Maybe you can get your hands on some of it. And Joseph becomes aware of what when these fellows from Canaan come into his courts. Oh, up there they are. Those are the guys who put me in the pit and sold me to the Ishmaelites when I was taken off into slavery. What does this beautiful story of Joseph teach us? Joseph had to obviously still remember the pain. Probably might have been still carrying the emotional pain. But Joseph wept as he forgave his brothers. He says, I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to beat out revenge. I'm going to forgive him. Where does that come from? That comes from God. That is not of our human fallen nature. To be able to look at things in the past and forgive and forget and 
have the peace to move on. But God also heals from present emotional turmoil as well. Things that are happening in time and space right now. I do refer you now, if you would, a turn in your New Testament to Mark chapter 4. Uh, Mark chapter 4 contains a story, an episode in the life of Christ where he did his ministry on a lake and oftentimes uh, the Sea of Galilee is included in his ministry. In Mark chapter 4 verse 35, listen to what happened. It says, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? You still have no faith. They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know? Well, that was an in the moment, real emotional situation with those disciples on the Sea of Galilee. But what can we take from that with Jesus being there with them? In that moment, when they were so terrified and so afraid. Well, you see, Jesus is aware of our fear. He's aware of our anxiety. He's aware of our anger. He's aware of every kind of emotional pain that we might be in right now. He's aware. Oh, yes, He was napping, but He was aware Jesus does care about our emotional pain. He obviously cared about what was happening that day. He awoke. He surmised the situation and he simply took authority over the elements and he, he dealt with a good deal of their emotional pain. At least the emotional pain that we're going to drown today in the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus does care. Oh my friend, He does care our pain. And Jesus does give us faith to overcome. He asked His disciples that day, where is your faith? Where is your faith in Me? The one who cares for you. The one who is aware of your emotional pain. Where is it? I don't know what kind of current emotional crisis you might be in. You might not be in any. And that's a true blessing. You can rest assured that Jehovah Rophi is the God who heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds of those who are in great emotional pain. And then you think about the future and emotions, the future. A lot of people get caught up in this crisis of emotions. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know the future. I can't see my way into the future. We need to ask ourselves these four, what I call healing questions, when we think about our emotions and the future. True, we don't know the future. But ask ourselves these questions. Question number one, am I the sovereign Lord or is Jehovah Rophi the sovereign Lord? Question two, do I control the future or does Jehovah Rophi control the future? Now those are two questions when we answer correctly, we conclude rightly that our future is in the hands of God. Jehovah Rophi, the God who healeth thee, who binds up our broken hearts and heals our emotional wounds. The third question then we must ask, do I believe that Jehovah Rophi is a liar? That He's not going to heal me? Or help me be healed? Is this a bluff? And then fourthly, 
Do I trust that Jehovah Rophi will provide for my future? Do I trust that the God who has said, I am your Lord and I heal with me, will he provide for our future? You see, Jehovah Rophi heals us from our emotional scars. He knows our pain. Now, does he ever completely heal us? No, no he doesn't. He doesn't ever completely heal us. But oh, he is there to help in some very profound ways. Did you know that just recently on the 16th of August, it was the 47th anniversary of the death of Elvis Aaron Presley? Did you know any, any Elvis fans here this morning? I like Elvis. Always have liked Elvis. One of his early hit songs was what? Well, there were many. One of his most popular came out in 1956, entitled Heartbreak Hotel. I want to read for you the lyrics of Heartbreak Hotel. Well, this was Elvis Aaron Presley up on a stage somewhere in 1956, getting in trouble with the local authorities for moving, shaking, and jiving as he was, singing this. Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lonely Street, that Heartbreak Hotel. You make me so lonely, baby, while I'm so lonely, I get so lonely I could die. Although it's always crowded, you can still find some room for broken-hearted lovers to cry away their blue. And on he sang. That's a song, but I really do think it's a song that is very relevant because sometimes even as believers, we can find ourselves checking in the Heartbreak Hotel. And it is located on Lonely Street. But who is there to help us even when we check into the Heartbreak Hotel? God is. Jehovah Rufi, our great healer, with our emotional baggage and pain and struggles, is there. He is there to help. Let's look at one final aspect of the ministry of Jehovah Rophi, and that is he provides physical healing. Of course, of course, he is in the business of healing things that are not just spiritual, not just emotional, but literally physical things. You see, physical healing is a part of God's ministry. And we see many examples of in the Bible where God physically heals by what I call and theologians call natural means. Not necessarily an organic change in something, the lengthening of a limb or something of that nature, but, but more in the realm of, of nature. And the example I give to you is from Genesis 20, 17. It's in the life of Abraham and a king named Abimelech. Abimelech got interested in Abraham's wife. Abraham made a mistake and didn't stand up for his wife. And it was kind of a confused situation. And God stepped in. And this is what we read. Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his slave girl so that they could have children again. For the Lord had closed up every womb in Abimelech's household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. So in a very natural way, there was there, they got, the, the, the wounds were simply closed. And God simply opened up the wounds. He didn't create something. He didn't do anything other than in a natural way say, in my providence, I am now going to allow Abimelech, wife and, 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 and daughter, I'm going to allow them now to have children. But the Bible is also ever filled with what? Miraculous miraculous things that cannot be explained that go against all medical knowledge and the laws of nature are superseded by God. One of the great healings of Christ in my opinion is found in Mark 10 blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is making his way to the city of Jericho and all along the road, there are people crying out to him, David, I mean, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, and that they want to be touched by Christ. And there is this one blind man sitting there 
And he reaches out and he's able to touch the cloak of Jesus. And Jesus turns, says, who touched me? And what is affected that day in the life of blind Bartimaeus is he's now able to see wherein he was not able to see before. Friends, that's a miracle. That's an organic, anatomical change in the physical disposition of a person done, nonetheless, by the power of God. Now, God is still healing today by both natural and miraculous means. <clears throat> by natural means, we see all the time, don't we? We've seen it right here in our congregation, haven't we? People have major surgeries. They're in the hospital for long periods of time. And God brings them back. God heals them. He gives them strength again. But there are also miraculous things that still happen. But listen closely. It is not normative. In other words, we should not expect that there are people who have uh, the gift of healing like the early apostles had. And Elisha and Elijah had that could go around and affect such miraculous healings. It's not normative, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And everyone in here is probably aware of a circumstance where something miraculous has happened. I remember a circumstance up in Knoxville where uh, a lady had a close friend whose son had a heart attack. A couple, three days later, they were prepared to do the surgery. They prepped the man for surgery. They did one last scan or something or whatever. And there was nothing wrong with the guy's heart. No need for the open heart surgery. A, a, a amazing, a miraculous change of circumstances. But listen, we have no unconditional guarantee of physical healing, do we? I'm going to show me in the Bible where we are guaranteed that we will never be ill, we will never be afflicted with any kind of major life-threatening disease or anything like that. The people who, who report that, they're preposterous in holding such a position. You see, God chooses to sometimes allow us to patiently endure suffering. Physical suffering. Due to physical ailments. And things that God allows to come into our home. Why would God do that? If He is Jehovah Rophi, why would He not just decree that I guarantee you can tell who's a Christian and who's not a Christian because Christians never get sick. They never die of cancer. They never have problems with their heart muscle. They never get Alzheimer's. No, that is not the, the reality of life, is it? He does so, my friend, to increase our faith and dependence on Him. That we would still know and love and serve Him in spite of the fact that we have to carry heavy physical burdens around. I quote the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Listen to Paul's testimony. Now this is the great Apostle. This is the man who saw Jesus, spent years with Jesus, had many conversations with Jesus. Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Said he went to heaven one time. Listen to this man. You think he has got to definitely be the guy upon whom nothing ever bad happens, right? Paul says to keep me from becoming conceited. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But He said to me, listen to what God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. That's an amazing testimony. It's real easy to throw a pity party when some affliction comes our way and says, oh Lord, why me? The Lord is using that, even as Jehovah wrote our healer, to 
teach us to love Him. You see, God can give physical healing now, but He certainly will give physical healing in the age to come. You know, the glorious promise of the Gospel is not just our experience in this life as born again believers. We are told by the apostles and by Christ Himself that there will come a day when we will be delivered into the glory of Christ and our bodies will be resurrected and they will be transformed into glorious bodies. <coughs> glorious bodies. Where there will be no sickness. There will be no physical affliction in that day. You see, Jehovah Rophi is the God who heals His people. Spiritually does He. Emotionally does He. Yes, even physically. And in the future one day, we will have the experience, my friend, of the complete healing of Jehovah Rophi. Listen, we'll have no more spiritual issues. We'll have no more emotional issues. We'll have no more physical issues. It will be great, but we are not there yet. So, just how healed up are you this morning as you sit there in that pew, as I stand here behind this pulpit? How healed up are you? Spiritually, I hope you are healed. I hope that you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have been healed by way of Jehovah Rophi. Remember it is said, He heals all of our diseases. Yea, He forgives us of all of our sins. Emotional healing. We all need to continue to call for the grace of God to help us with these emotional struggles. Physical healing. We pray for the mercy of God for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our fellow believers, that God would very well bring healing physically, but sometimes He doesn't. Listen, let us never be shy to call upon Jehovah Rophi to bring us healing. The ancient Israelites out beside that bitter pool of water, they cried out to the Lord, Lord, You must bring healing to these waters. And He did. So should we cry to God when we experience a real need for healing. And let me add this. Why don't, why don't we try to bring others who have yet to know Jehovah Rophi, the great God of healing. Let us bring them to Jesus Christ who said it was His mission, I have come for those who are sick. To bring them spiritual healing. Jehovah Rophi, our great God. Lord, You are the consummate healer. You have healed us of our spiritual diseases and forgiven us of all of our sins. Emotionally, You have mercy on us and physically as well, Lord. You watch over us and bring Your healing touch. Father, I pray that You would more and more make us the people here at Redeemer to cry out to You even as the ancient Israelites did. Cry out to You for healing and receive the healing that You bring to us and testify, of, testify the great healing mercies that are ours in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 501 Just As I Am Without One Plea. And I would just add this that if you're not familiar with the story that inspired Charlotte Elliott to pen this hymn, it's well worth um, checking out.
God, receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord God bless you and keep you. Make His face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lift up His peace upon you. And give you His grace now and through. Wow. Wow. I can't wait to live in your eyes. I can't wait to live in your eyes. I can't wait to live in your eyes. I can't wait to live in your eyes.